The most famous or infamous example of this anti-war sentiment came in New York City, right here, in the New York City draft riots. I've mentioned them briefly in July 1863. Now the draft, remember the Confederacy had introduced conscription in 1862. The North passes a draft law in 1863. As in the Confederacy, there are ways out of the draft. You can buy your way out for $300 which is about the annual income of a worker in New York, or you can provide a substitute. So both North and South, there's a very significant class element built into the draft laws that people with money can get themselves out of the draft. And one of the most famous important Americans of the later 19th century made a lot of money in the war after buying himself out of the draft. And that was J.P. Morgan, who was just a local businessman at that time, but saw the opportunities, the business opportunities afforded by the war and didn't want to spend his time in the army. So um, now the draft in the North did not actually produce a lot of soldiers. Um, about 40,000 draftees were in the army. There Two million men fought for the Union Army. Of those, about 40,000 were people who had actually been drafted, and another 120,000 were substitutes. That is, people who were paid privately by someone who was drafted to go in his place. So that's 160,000. That's still, that's a lot of men, but it's not a very high percentage of the army, less than 10%, certainly. The draft filled in gaps in state quotas and it also spurred volunteering. One of the main purposes of the draft is to get people to volunteer, because if you volunteered for the army, you got a, bo a bonus. You got, uh, I don't remember how much it was, but you got a significant bonus payment, which you could then give to your family to help them support them. But if you were drafted, you didn't get a bonus. So the theory was people afraid of being drafted would volunteer in order to get that, uh, in, in order to get that payment. But anyway, um, the New York City draft riots begin in Ju early July 1863 and go on for three or four days. They, they begin when the draft process actually begins. You know, actually, the New York Historical Society has this, it's a wonderful place to visit, has this draft, this like drum, literally, this big wooden round thing which they would turn, sort of like on, uh, you know, on TV when you see the... Um, you know, the lottery or whatever, the, the New York State uh, lottery, you know, they throw these balls. Anyway, you th they threw in a local area, they threw names, little pieces of paper with all the eligible men's names in. They turned the thing around and then some army officers started pulling out names and that's how, they, that's how the draft. It wasn't high tech or anything. But um, so when the draft begins in New York, first there's a mob that attacks the draft offices and then over the next couple of days it kind of spins out of control to become a general uprising, you might almost say, against all the, against the targets that kind of symbolize the results of the war. Against homes of uh, pr prominent Republicans and newspapers like the New York Tribune, against factories, uh, places there had been strikes recently, labor problems, and against the black population of New York. I, I showed you these pictures of the lynchings on the streets of New York uh, a, a couple of um, weeks ago. Um, nobody knows how many people were killed in the draft riots in New York. Well, the closest estimate is over 100. It's not quite clear, but quite a few of them were African Americans just killed on the streets of New York City. Uh, and many African American residents fled the city for New Jersey or Long Island. Um, the riot was a reflection of bitter conflicts, class conflict and race conflict, lying below the surface, not that far below the surface of New York City. Now, I have mentioned before that people reenact Civil War battles. We all know that. One of the odder things that ever passed my way, this a couple of years ago, was a reenactment at Old Bethpage, New York, a re believe me, a reenactment of the Civil War draft riot. That is weird, I hate to say it. <laughs> People reenacting a battle 
I can vaguely see it. Reenacting the draft riot, what is the point? I mean, I don't get it. I don't get it. What are they going to do? Start assaulting black people in this thing or, or tearing down buildings? I don't know what. Anyway, they held a reenactment of the draft riot out there in Nassau County. So you never know. I mean, I grew up in Long Island, and it's a very weird place. So <laughs> this is a good example of that. Another cause of significant criticism was civil liberties in wartime. War always puts pressure on civil liberties. We know that. The, was Lincoln a tyrant? There were certainly arbitrary arrests. Some newspapers were closed temporarily. Habeas corpus, the right that is to have a charge against you if you're going to be arrested and held, was suspended throughout the whole North by 1863. Um, there had been persecution of critics of the Mexican War. There had been a lot of persecution in the American Revolution, actually. A lot of loyalists were deeply persecuted. Um, but um, this, the issue of wartime dissent came to the fore in what, you know, the New York Times says, and this is, of course, a common idea, the safety of the nation is the supreme law. The safety of the nation. Everything else takes, is subordinate to that. Therefore, and Lincoln himself, who is not, you know, is not a tyrant, but Lincoln holds views on civil liberties which are far different, I think, from what most people today say. Lincoln, Lincoln in one of his public letters defending some of these arbitrary arrests, not only, he says, the, well, well he, sa he says, should I shoot a deserter, deserters could be shot, if they, but not touch a hair on the head of the agitator who has told him to desert. In other words, people, he claims, are going around telling people to desert from the army. Should he just allow that to happen because of freedom of speech? Lincoln says no. Lincoln also, though, goes on to say, even the person who is silent is guilty. In other words, if you do not publicly support the war effort, if you are silent, you are guilty of opposing the government, opposing the war, and can be punished in some way. That, that is very different than what we, I think, I hope, think today. Um, now, there were, Mark Neely, who's written the most important book about this, says there were about 10,000, 11,000 people arrested at one time or another in the North. But the vast majority of those were in the border states and were people who were actively taking up arms against the government. So it's not really a violation of civil liberties if you arrest a guy who's about to blow up a railroad bridge. Um, they may have been arrested without habeas corpus, but that's not what we're really talking about with dissent. The number of people arrested for speech against the war or newspaper editorials against the war, there were those, was small but real. And um, uh, much of that was done by overzealous local officials like the local commander in Illinois suspended the Chicago Times, a major Democratic newspaper, because of anti-war writing. Lincoln eventually, even Republican newspapers complained about this, and Lincoln overturned that. So, um, but it, the, the opposition to the Lincoln administration was also spurred by this. Well, we're almost out of time, so let me just finish by saying that the, ultimately the, 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 the consequences of the war play out for many, many years after the war is over the consequence of national consolidation, the consequence of the big boost being given to the power of industrialists and bankers, um, consolidation of business, mechanization. You know, somehow hundreds of thousands of men are drawn off the farms, and most northern soldiers were farmers, because that's where most people were, uh, came from farm families. Um, but agricultural production increases during the war. How? Mechanization more use of agricultural machinery, more use of reapers and sowers and things like that. Um, but that costs money. Farmers have to go into debt in order to buy this equipment, and debt out in the farms leads to a lot of agricultural agitation uh, after the war, leading up eventually to the populist uh, movement in the 1890s. Um, but the main, so the, just to summarize, the, the um, the war creates 
the national dominance of the Republican Party, number one. From, the, from 1860 to 1932, that's 72 years, only two Democrats are elected president, Grover Cleveland and then Woodrow Wilson. And Wilson is elected because the Republican Party splits in 1912. The Republicans are the dominant party in the nation. Even though they're a northern sectional party and a western sectional party, and after Reconstruction they have little power in the South, they nonetheless control most of the time the national government. And one of the results of that is that national economic policy favors the North. It favors the banking interests of the North. It favors the industrial interests of the North. And um, it puts on the agenda the main issue the main issue put on the agenda by the war is the aftermath of slavery. What is going to be the status of the four million slaves who are now free after the war? What, how is the South going to be reconstructed on the basis of free labor rather than slave labor? But many other political issues of the late 19th century come out of the Civil War. What should be the tariff? How should the bondholders get paid, in greenbacks or in gold? What should happen to this paper money? This becomes, I mean, we, we had a political party in the 1870s and 80s called the Greenback Party. I can't think of another country where you have a party named after a piece of currency. Do they have a pound party in England? I don't think so, or the euro party, I don't know. But um, the, these issues become the basis of national politics after Reconstruction is over. So the war, the, the war sets the agenda for the next generation or two of the post-war world. Okay, next time we will go back and see how the war is progressing in 1863, 64, 65.